short on local water supplies, and long on regulatory requirements. Do a deep dive with us by listening to the Full Circle Podcast to learn how Las Virginas Municipal Water District and the Triumph of Water and Sanitation no District water. are meeting 21st century water supply challenges for a portion of the Los Angeles and Ventura County regions. All right. Welcome to the Full Circle Podcast. My name is Ricky Clark, your host, and today I am joined by my colleague, Veronica Hurtado, and we are going to be dis discussing all things water in the Los Virginis Conejo region, specifically the Pure Water Project set to bring our region a brand new local drinking supply by 2028. So, in our last episode, we dove deep into the history of the region and how we were basically here because we needed some new water. That's the only reason why we're here. We got the water and everything else was allowed to bloom. But today we're going to be talking about sort of a different aspect of the Pure Water Project. And it was really the core impetus of why the Las Virginas Triunfo Joint Powers Authority decided to embark on the Pure Water Project. And that is the infamous, or maybe regular famous, Malibu Creek. So Malibu Creek is our local uh, watershed here, and it's also, I believe, the largest watershed draining into the Santa Monica Bay, largest watershed north of the Santa Monica Bay, um, home to about 90,000 residents who enjoy trails and hiking and biking and all kinds of camping, as well as countless flora and fauna um, that exists within the creek, specifically the endangered Tidewater goby, mm -hmm. the steelhead trout, and the brown pelican. Lots of different creatures and, and humans uh, dependent on that creek and able to enjoy it. And also, um, within the JPA, it's sort of our responsibility to manage uh, the goings on in that creek, right, as, uh, as it pertains specifically to water and water quality. So thus, as a result of increased urbanization and things like that, there's been some issues with water quality as well as quantity in the creek. And um, these are challenges that the JPA uh, has been committed to meeting for decades now. All right, so let's get into it. Let's get into the minutia, but first, again, Veronica Hurtado is here to join us. She is the water reclamation manager at our Tapia Water Reclamation Facility. Veronica. Hi, Ricky. Thank, thank you, you for having me. Thank you for joining. Are you excited to be on our podcast today? I am excited. We're excited to have you. So before we get into the technical side of things in Malibu Creek, um, Veronica, I really wanted to chat with you sort of about your experience in the industry because you had a quite the unique unique um, path as far as your profession in water yeah, and really something that you were able to carve out on your own in a largely male dominated uh, environment. So um, I kind of just wanted to chat about that for a second. So can you talk about first, what do you do as water reclamation manager? Yeah, so um, I just recently uh, took over this position, the water reclamation manager, and as the water reclamation manager, I oversee the management of the Tapia Water Treatment Facility, as well as the Rancho Composting Facility, and the Water Quality Laboratory with the district. Mm. So it's a lot of responsibilities. It is. It is <laughs> a lot of responsibilities. Um, I am the main point of contact and the legally responsible person for with the Regional Water Quality Control Board. I. Um, which is our pr primary regulatory agency. I ensure that our permits get renewed and that we comply with all the regulatory requirements within those permits. Lots As, of responsibility. Lots of responsibility, <laughs> yes. So um, from day to day, my, I just uh, stay on top of um, what is going on at each of those facilities. My staff will come to me with concerns or operations um, for direction. So I do my best to provide them a means for uh, the direction for the day. Uh, most of the time, it's they'll tell me that something is going wrong, <laughs> or a piece of equipment needs to be replaced or needs to be maintained, and then I start trying to figure out how to get that piece of equipment going uh, to work. 
uh, replaced. Yeah. And most most of that time is finding the budget for it. <laughs> how many staff do you have? How, how large is your staff, Veronica? My staff is 23. So I have five direct reports, supervisors that report to me. Wow. And be beneath them, there's another 18. Wow. So that includes uh, my direct reports. My supervisors are the chief plant operator, Rancho uh, Las Virgenes composting supervisor, water quality laboratory supervisor, mm. my administrative assistant, and my management analyst. That is quite a list, <laughs> y'all. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that's across two facilities, correct? That is two, two facilities, yes. Two separate facilities that you're in mm -hmm. charge of, yeah. So you definitely have a lot on your plate, but you've worked a number of those jobs. You've filled those positions here at Las Virgenes. So can you kind of talk about your path and sort of where you started and where you're at now? Uh, yeah, so I started my career path with the thought that one day I'd be a marine biologist. Wow. <laughs> so <laughs> I chose, um, the, my college of choice was uh, the University of California, Santa Barbara, because they do have a marine biology program there. Mm -hmm. So I completed that, pro that uh, my undergraduate degree in aquatic biology uh, from UCSB. I worked with UCSB in their Marine Science Institute for a couple of years while I was in school. And right after college, I worked for the Santa Barbara Museum of Natural History nice. at the Ty Warner Sea Center. I was a collector for them and a uh, educator, tank, uh, life support specialist. Wow. Um, <laughs> so I worked for them for a couple of years after graduation. And I can honestly say that I felt like I became a marine biologist. I could imagine. But Just you so naming I, off the things that you did. That sounds like so much fun. It was a lot of fun. Every I scientist's loved it. dream. <laughs> I did. I did truly enjoy that. Um, those uh, those jobs that I had, and um, I thought it was a career move in the right direction, but once I decided that it was time to leave Santa Barbara, I um, applied for aquariums around California, so Monterey Bay Aquarium and, of course, the Aquarium of the Pacific. But I also wanted to explore other uh, related um, professions in, the, in um, the sciences. Sure. So I noticed a posting about a biology laboratory um, technician for the LA County Sanitation District. And at the same time, I feel like it was almost within the same day, I received phone calls from both uh, applications that I had put in and I interviewed for from the Aquarium of the Pacific and from LA County Sanitation District. Wow. You would so, never like <laughs> yeah. think that those things were in the same realm and then here you are. They they are different but somewhat related. So um they both offered me positions, and the starting salary with LA County Sanitation was so much higher that I had to de had to make a decision, uh, and I decided to go for it and see what this industry was all about. So that was my step into the water treatment industry. Shameless plug for public sector, right? <laughs> Specifically water. I feel yes. like it's considered that like you know we don't get like the highest mm. paying thing, and, and sure, but like it's still pretty solid compared to a lot of other professions. It is, it is. It's a very secure industry to be in. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I definitely thought about that security when I, when I decided to, to switch gears and be more on the water treatment side versus the educational side. Yeah, and you know, another shameless plug for <laughs> jobs in water, you could have an interest academically in almost anything. You can study so many different things in college and find a home for what you're interested in or for what your you know field of study was in water, right? Mm -hmm. Marine biologists, water reclamation manager yep. in water now. <laughs> You'd never associate the two, but here you are. It's a process to find the right path, and, and um, I'm lucky to be here now. Yeah, so. I feel the same way. <laughs> so what was the first, what was your first position at LA San? So from LA County, oh, uh, LA County Sanitation, I was a biology technician. Okay. So in their biology lab. Mm -hmm. And once I had my foot in the door there. I understood what we were doing in water treatment and I op it opened my eyes to other opportunities. And I decided to um, move out of LA mm. and I started looking for other 
uh, laboratory tech p positions with mm -hmm. other agencies, and I that's when I came across Las Virginas um, Municipal Water District, and they had an opening um, for a laboratory assistant. I applied. I was successful candidate, and. Um, I, that was 16 years ago. The rest was history. <laughs> so I have been with LVMWD for 16 years. I started as their laboratory assistant. I began getting um, state certifications as laboratory analysts. Uh, took the test, got my certifications, which um, allowed me to promote to laboratory technician. And then I decided that I wanted to even further my education in the water treatment industry. I went back to school to get my master's in environmental engineering um, at Loyola Marymount University. The master's of engineering. Master's in that is engineering. Impressive. <laughs> I cannot imagine. So, um, and that basically prepared me to apply for positions as a management analyst. And then subsequently, um, the engineering department brought me on board to learn about project management, project engineering, and CIP budgeting. Nice. So you already had your bachelor's, right? Because obviously mm -hmm. you went to Santa Barbara for marine biology. Mm -hmm. But while you were working here at LV specifically, not only did you get on the job education, mm -hmm. but you were also able to further your education. And that has served you great, right? That has served me very well. Yeah. I, there is a education reimbursement program with LV, which I appreciated and took advantage of, and um, it just helped me get through the the program that I, um, the environmental engineering program with LMU. Yeah, and I'm sure that the work-life balance that comes with mm -hmm. water jobs in public <laughs> sector in general helps with you being able to execute that master's of engineering. Of course, Which of is course. no small feat. Oh my gosh, I mean, a master's in any discipline is super impressive, but a master's of engineering, like, mm -hmm. yeah, that's super impressive. So you've been in water for 16 years, you said? Mm -hmm. Um, do you feel like you've seen a lot of change in the industry over the years? Because you're kind of a vet. Yes and no. The treatment processes are basically the same. They have been for decades. Mm -hmm. Not too much changes as far as uh, f piping, flows, uh, primary, primary uh, secondary, tertiary treatment. Mm -hmm. That's all the same. What I am seeing is improvements in those processes and time to uh, upgrades um, that can be implemented with the existing processes. Mm -hmm. So in a way, yes, the, the techniques are improving, the technology is improving, and mm -hmm. we are even now trying to focus on automations. So there, are, there have been changes, but the general biology, chemistry mm -hmm. is still the same. Right, and it's tried and true, mm -hmm. right? It's tried so and true systems. It doesn't necessarily need to be changed, but what we have with time and innovation is upgrades for efficiency, right? We got the new blowers that helped with mm -hmm. efficiency, and you know we're depending more on clean energy to help you know run mm -hmm. things. So that's always good to see. What about um, sort of like staff and like what you're seeing like around? Well, with staff, I have seen many come and go. And m luckily, most of it has been through retirements. Yeah. So once you enter this industry, you pretty much stick with it. So Specifically it with LV people. That's what she's really trying to say. Once mm -hmm. you get here, people tend to stick around. People stick around. They stay They uh, um, because of that security factor for it. Interesting. But I have I have been through the silver tsunami. Yeah. Um, I've seen it when, and it always hurts when you lose that legacy information. Yes. That institutional knowledge. It is really hard to replace that. It is. And because not too many um, changes occur over time, you lose that the seasoned veteran mm -hmm. who knows the nuances of a particular instrument. Sure. So, so it is always hard, and uh, that's why our succession planning is is important. Is get but when we anticipate 
a, an operator or lab tech or anybody um, retiring, plan ahead and get somebody in to start learning and do that knowledge transfer. Absolutely. And shadowing them while they're mm -hmm. still here is as long as possible. I mean, I've seen some positions have that shadowing period for months. Mm -hmm. I remember that for like an administrative assistant or like administrative assistant to the GM in a place that I've worked for in the past. Mm -hmm. The person filling that position was shadowing the person that was getting ready to retire for like three or four months. And that's what it takes sometimes, mm -hmm. you know? And you know, it's funny hearing you talk about losing that institutional knowledge because, you know, you've been in the game for 16 years, right? <laughs> <laughs> and I, 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 I do have quite a bit of institutional knowledge, which has pretty much helped me transition to the position of water reclamation manager very seamlessly, but mm -hmm. I still have quite a bit to learn. And that's a great point to make. I mean, especially here in, in, in this region, we have, you know, people like Glenn Peterson that have worked mm -hmm. in water for decades and decades and decades. And you chat with them, you learn from them, and you realize that they really do know so much. And sometimes when you envision yourself being someone with that type of knowledge and that expertise it's like oh my goodness you've worked here for 16 years and you still feel like there's so much more to learn but you have to remember that the people that are like the experts they've been in this business for a long time that's something that i think is very interesting about water you can work in water for years you've been in water for 16 years i've been in water for almost 10 years and i still don't feel like i know that much compared to people in the industry that i know are like real thought leaders and really like ahead of the game and sort of the leaders in the region and in large parts in the state there's so much to know about water, the business of water, the chemistry of water, treatment, you know, Malibu Creek, which we're gonna get into with this episode, there are so many aspects that you can have years and years and years and still like feel like there's so much more to learn. But indeed, Veronica, especially with, you know, the silver tsunami that we've had in the past few years, you're definitely sort of like one of the OGs now, <laughs> which is yeah. why you're in this position, very mm -hmm. much deserved. And, you know, I know that you have a lot of experience that's gonna serve you well, but it's really exciting knowing someone like you is is where they deserve based on the work that they've put in and thinking about everything that you have before you is really exciting. Thanks, Ricky. Yeah, absolutely. Definitely an uh, inspiration to us all, all the women bosses. So let's switch gears a little bit. Okay. Uh, you know, this episode, we kind of wanted to get into the situation with Malibu Creek. And like I mentioned earlier, um, those of us that are living in this region or even better native to this region, we know all about Malibu Creek. People like to fish and camp and, you know, recreate out there. Um, obviously, Malibu Creek is home to many flora and fauna that, you know, call that place home. Obviously, it drains out into um, Surfrider Beach. Um, but really, the reason why we're talking about Malibu Creek today is as it pertains to the Pure Water Project. And indeed, creating a new water supply is super important for the region. Again, we are um, dependent on that one source of water coming through the State Water Project all the way from the Northern Sierra Nevada Mountains over 400 miles away. And this project is going to create a new local supply of water, which is very badly needed. But that wasn't necessarily the original impetus to this project. The original impetus was largely regulatory driven as it is um, in the industry. And it was mainly around regulatory uh, issues with Malibu Creek. And so let's get into that. When we talk about Malibu Creek, you always hear about this fragility, right? Can you kind of speak to what that fragility really means in Malibu Creek? Mm. Well, as with uh, any receiving waters or waters of the state, there's the concern that um, an effluent discharge will add nutrients, and it does. So the fragility there is you're um, adding highly nutrient water to a recreational water source. Now, we can get into uh, regulat regulatory agencies involved, um, 
or the environmental um, outlets that are concerned with the with the creek, but down to the biology, uh, effluent discharge. That's what we refer to as um, the tapia treated. Um, discharge. And so that's the recycled water the recycled that we treat water. at Tapia, right? Mm -hmm. So that is that Title 22 yes. tertiary treated recycled water that we've, you know, we've talked about this before, but mm -hmm. it's odorless, it's safe for human contact. We're talking about highly treated recycled water that is just a couple steps below drinking water standards, right? Yeah, it's a uh, highly treated as you said, tertiary tertiary treated water, highly um, safe uh, uh, water mm -hmm. and we discharge to Malibu Creek. It still has um, levels of nutrients that could potentially cause uh, algal growth in the creek. Mm -hmm. That algal growth um, causes some oxygen consumption and what's that referred to as eutrophication. Okay. So there's always that concern that you, uh, the eutrophication could occur in Malibu Creek which does hinder other um, micro, um, I'm sorry, macro invertebrates, mm -hmm. uh, um, the fauna of, right. the, of the creek. Disturbs the food it chain, just, it could, all it, um, it could potentially cause an imbalance in the mm -hmm. ecosystem. Mm -hmm. So ever since um, the Clean Water Act came, came about, mm -hmm. then there have been uh, permits for discharges to the creek. So, and Tapia and LVMWD have always abided by those permit limits. Yeah, and you know, as the water district or the prevailing water district um, in the region, obviously a lot of what goes on the creek kind of befalls us, and that's, mm -hmm. you know, what you basically, one of the many things that you mm -hmm. do, I should say. Um, the JPA is largely involved in ensuring the water quality in that creek, specifically for the flora and fauna. Mm -hmm. So it's not just about water quality for us humans, but also our environment. And we try to be responsible stewards of the environment and there is a huge regulatory aspect with that and um, that's what you what you speak to mm -hmm. yes um, other cons other uh, interested parties uh, Malibu Creek does flow into the Malibu Lagoon mm -hmm. and then out to the ocean from there right and so you mentioned this earlier, but just for clarification, obviously Malibu Creek, it runs right parallel with our Tapia water reclamation mm -hmm. facility so that the water that's treated there when we need to, we can discharge it right into the creek, right? Mm -hmm. We do that uh, primarily when there is an excess of this recycled water. Um, but of course, we have another use for that water and that is for irrigation. Mm -hmm. So we use about 60% more or less of all of the recycled water that comes out of Tapia to irrigate irrigate public spaces within the JPA service area. Um, so parks, schools use a lot of recycled water, golf courses. We are able to use this water so that we can save actual drinking water for higher uses, of mm -hmm. course, for human use, drinking and eating and cleaning and things like that. But we don't always need that water, specifically mm -hmm. in the cooler months, obviously, especially when you have weather events like we've had this past winter, we don't always need that water for irrigation. There are definitely times of low um, recycled water demand, mm -hmm. which uh, requires us to find other outlets for the uh, discharge, for the disposable disposal of um, tapia affluent. Right. So we discharge obviously about 60% um, or about 40% of the excess that we mm -hmm. have when we don't need to irrigate as much. And so that's the primary purpose for discharging into the creek. But we're also responsible now for sort of uh, maintaining the flows in the creek mm -hmm. uh, to make sure all of the flora and the fauna are able to live and exist there. And so for those that are familiar with the creek and that are oftentimes native to this area, sometimes when I'm out and about schmoozing with the public, I get comments and questions about this artificial environment that we've created in the creek. Can you talk a little bit about that? It's super interesting. It is super interesting and very complicated. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and this predates my time with the district. Of course. Um, I know there have been times where uh, we've made the argument that we can actually uh, pull out of the creek and not have to discharge at all. 
However, we, um, the Tapia Water Reclamation Facility and Discharge to the Creek pre-exists the Clean Water Act. <laughs> so before NPDES permits, were even drafted, yeah. Um, and we've had imp- and we've had impedious permits for so long. So the basically before the creek was even and regulated, be- and before the recycled water system was in place. Yeah. So Tapia has always uh, discharged recycled water to uh, Malibu Creek. At one point, when we did install the recycled water system, and limits began getting increasingly increasingly harder to achieve rather than improve the treatment process we like we considered the option of not discharging to the creek at all right. however regulatory agencies as well as maybe i think it was as it might have been the department of fish and game at the time it's now the california department of fish and wildlife they m- made the argument that we've been supplying this resource Mm -hmm. to the creek for so long we can no longer withdraw it since the 60s right yes decades it it would be an incidental take is what the uh, cdfw would call it Mm. so we maintain a requirement to uh, continue to discharge to the creek and that's um, somewhat the artificial environment we've created if we had never existed the creek would run dry on occasion or it would have very low flows. And there would probably not be anything close to the amount of life that's currently there if that, it ran dry regularly, right? That's possible. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Wow. That's always an interesting thing to think about. <laughs> like, what would have happened if we were never discharging? Would development still be the same? Mm-hmm. Would people still be able to enjoy, like, you know, hiking and camping as much? I mean, it would have changed the landscape, mm-hmm. you know, sort of like this butterfly effect. Like, what would have what would have have been (laughs) Um, but yeah but you know you know thankful to the to the regulatory side of things in these agencies that are saying you know we have to continue to supply that water Mm -hmm. it's been working up until this point and we still have this flora and fauna flourishing as much as they can endangered or not Um, and if that's what's been working then we have to keep it up Um, Of course, moving forward, though, we're not going to be able to use this recycled water. Um, And we kind of touched on this before, but in the future, and again, this was the reason for this Pure Water Project, we are not going to be allowed to discharge recycled water into the creek anymore for disposal purposes. We'll still have to ensure adequate flows in the creek, even though we're not discharging that recycled water anymore. So can you talk about how exactly we're going to be doing that using breakpoint chlorination? Yes, I'll uh, reiterate that our NPDES permit is one of the more complicated permits um, uh, that I've ever read. <laughs> and that's because we have so many outlets mm-hmm. of, um, for disposal. We have spray fields, we have 005, but our primary outlet is our uh, discharge straight to Malibu Creek. Okay. We touched on um, the requirement to sustain that flow because of the artificial environment we've created. And so it's now to a point where we have to, we are required to flow to the creek if the creek levels were to drop at uh, to a significant uh, level. Is that measured by CFS? It is by cubic feet per second. Okay. So um, to add another layer of compl- complication mm-hmm. to this NPDES permit, we have uh, seasons for discharge between November 15th and April 15th. We can. Uh, we were allowed to we we are allowed to discharge to the creek until the year 2030 and mm-hmm. that's where pure water um, will take effect in mm-hmm. at, uh, for the winter season as of may of 2022 we are no longer allowed to discharge effluent to the creek during the summer season april april 15th through november 14th mm-hmm. 15th that was last year yes okay. so may 22 so but our requirement to discharge for um, endangered species, what we call stream flow augmentation, it is in our permit that we have to discharge to the creek when the creek level drops below 2.5 cubic feet per second. And now that we are not 
able to discharge our Title 22 um, water, mm -hmm. we had to come up with a new solution for that. So the way we are going around it is we are retrofitting existing facilities to create a side stream from a potable water pipeline and do what you mentioned, breakpoint chlorination. So that is super hyper chlorinating uh, potable water. Super hyper, <laughs> I love that. <laughs> hyper chlorinating the water mm -hmm. to remove ammonia. So ammonia will off gas because potable water has a has an ammonia concentration that we that we are not allowed to discharge. Mm -hmm. So this is um, how we're treating potable water, then dechlorinating it to meet the new limits in our NPDES permit. How how do we dechlorinate? Uh, it's a soda, sodium bisulfite dosage. Okay. So so once it's gone through the contact time through this new. Uh, um, treatment train mm -hmm. then at that point it gets dechlorinated and then it's just potable water um, supplementing the creek flow Wow mm -hmm. and that infrastructure is already on site right it is on strike on it is on site it's uh, about 90% constructed right yeah it's it's very interesting because you can see it at the outfall for anyone that's ever been at tapia you can kind of see the new construction there at mm -hmm. the very end and so that's specifically because we have two separate permits fall mm -hmm. and summer correct mm -hmm. and so that's um going to get us um basically in compliance. In compliance. That's what I was looking in for. Compliance in compliance with the for permit. the summer permit, <laughs> correct? For the summer permit. There are years where we don't have to discharge at all because the, like this year, it was a very wet year. Yeah. So the water table will stay up high enough. There will be creek flows and um, runoff for probably through this entire summer season. Mm -hmm. So, but shout we, out to Mother Nature. <laughs> yes. Um, so we may not have to use this new system at all this year but we had to have it in place for the years where drought prevails and um, the creek levels dropped below 2.5 CFS. Yeah, so you know, it might seem counterintuitive that the water that moving forward we're discharging into the creek has to be higher quality than it we're used to, mm -hmm. but it really does come down to like the technicalities, right? And those, the nutrient levels and how that, you know, impacts the, the life there. Um, and again, we are not only a water agency that provides water and wastewater and composting services to our service area, but we also have a large hand in the protection of our watershed um, and the management of that creek, which is so highly protected. And so it seems like a weird thing, but it's, it's all to make sure that we are responsible stewards mm -hmm. of the environment. So, you know, you've already touched on this a few times, but there's some pretty complicated permitting involved with the creek um, in the name of, of the protection of the creek and watershed protection in general. Can you talk about the per the subsequent permitting that the JPA is now required to ab abide by? Sure. Uh, um, as you mentioned, up until now, uh, we the LVMWD has um, always complied with uh, updates to the National Pollutant Elimination Discharge System permits. That's NPDES is how I'll refer to it. Um, we love we've, acronyms in yeah. water. <laughs> so our NPDES permit uh, changes over the years. Tapia has gone through several upgrades to be able to comply to, with um, permit changes, so advancements in uh, water treatment processes, and we've gone from secondary treatment to tertiary treatment and built out the facility to its current state yeah. uh, for Title 22 discharge. Yeah, you know what, I, I kind of want to touch on that because this is a really important part of outreach, specifically mm -hmm. to the Pure Water Project, not necessarily just the advanced purification process, but the tertiary treatment process that happens at Tapia before we even get to the advanced purification process. So you talked about, secondary treatment and tertiary treatment. Mm -hmm. So just to expand a little bit on about that, 
Secondary treatment is super common. Facilities that do secondary treatment um, are all over the state in, in large numbers. And after that water is treated at, you know, or to secondary standards, I mm -hmm. guess is the right way to say that. Yeah. It is then uh, injected into the ground, right? There's different um, outlets for that. Some some have uh, ocean outfalls. Right, and so water is treated to secondary standards and then it's injected into the ground where natural aquifers are able to do a lot more of that filtration, mm -hmm. right? But we talked about this in our past episode. This area, this region, Los Virgins, Caneja region is very unique because we do not have active aquifers that we're able to use. The geography here is such that, or not geography, the geology here is such that we have a lot of dissolved solids in mm -hmm. our groundwater. That just makes it really icky to treat out. So we have to keep everything above ground and that's where tertiary treatment comes from. So after secondary treatment, we have tertiary treatment, which are basically tertiary filters. It's filtration. That's filtration. filtration. Um, and they're like, basically they mimic aquifers, right? Yeah, uh, our tertiary filters are made up of beds of gravel and anthracite. And anthracite mm -hmm. on top. Mm -hmm. And so we're basically mimicking mother nature, which we do so often in water, um, because we there has been a human component to what happens naturally. We have, um, there have been certain impacts in our area that don't really allow us to use the groundwater anymore. And again, just the geology in general just makes that difficult. So we mimic that with those tertiary filters and that's why we keep everything above ground. Yes, and that's what gets us to that Title 22 high, highly treated um, quality. Right. <laughs> And so the permitting, back to the permitting, sorry, I like to go on these tangents because I feel like this context is very important. <laughs> um, but yeah, so the permitting that came out of this, uh, that came from, you know, these new regulatory uh, Tapia has been able to keep up with uh, permit requirements um, until there was a 2013 EPA study, mm -hmm. the very long name, the, let's see, the total maximum daily load for <sighs> aka tmdl the team, again yeah we love acronyms in water because yeah. these things are really hard to remember <laughs> the total the well i'm trying to remember the whole study which <laughs> yes. is the total maximum daily load for mm -hmm. the um benefit of um macro benthic macro invertebrates yes um and that study impose some limits that were just unachievable unachievable by Tapia's current treatment methods. So in 2017, we our new NPDES permit outlined these new limits, which was a total phosphorus limit of 0 0.1, and that came down from three milligrams per liter. The total nitrogen limit of one milligram per liter that came down from 10 milligrams per liter. Wow. So that's with, significant. <laughs> so once we realized that these limits were just going to be unachievable um, based off uh, with current um, treatment processes, the district had to evaluate the situation and consider options for what we were going to do. And it would have been a high investment and change to the infrastructure at the facility, at um, the water reclamation facility, yeah. to actually put in membrane filtration and RO at that facility just to treat to the new regulatory standards and then discharge it into Malibu Creek. They would literally be getting higher standards than than uh, drinking water standards. For humans. For humans. Could you imagine the JPA board actually green lighting, spending hundreds of millions of dollars mm -hmm. to execute that upgrade just to throw away, literally throw away drinking water mm -hmm. into the creek and then out into the ocean when we don't have any local source of water. And then you have drought times like the last couple of years hit when our water supply availability is gravely in danger that 
was not going to happen. Mm -hmm. Obviously, that would not be responsible on behalf of the board or either one of our water districts, Triumph or Las Virginis. So obviously, we opted to reinvest that money into the Pure Water Project. So I'm glad you brought that up. That TMDL, that water quality study back in 2013, that was really the catalyst. Yeah. Right? It was the driver for new, for updated permit limits. Mm -hmm. And it brought to focus the the options that that we were facing yeah and and meeting these you know regulatory challenges are it's just that it's challenging right it's it's costly it takes a considerable amount of time um, considerable collaboration between many different agencies you know regulatory retail regional all kinds but that's what it takes to effectively ensure that our fragile watershed is protected. I mean, Malibu Creek watershed in the Santa Monica Mountains in general has a great deal of biodiversity, right? And that's worth protecting um, no matter how much money it costs. Um, and when you're able to get a new water source while you're at it, that's <laughs> kind of like, you know, doubly great, right? Of course, the JPA saw that if we had to spend the money to treat tapia effluent to a higher standard, then we might as well keep that supply as a resource within this district. Exactly, exactly. Um, so, you know, Veronica, we've chatted a lot about regulatory things and super technical concepts, but you've been at LV for 16 years, mm -hmm. and many of those years you served right at Tapia, which folks, if you haven't seen it or been to Tapia, it's gorgeous, right? It's You wouldn't think that of a wastewater treatment <laughs> facility, and certainly when you get there, you see the sights and you smell some of the smells in some places, but it's nestled right in the Santa Monica Mountains and it's gorgeous, whether it's sunny or it's overcast and cloudy like today. When you get to work there, you know, as much as you have and the staff there, you really get to appreciate the surroundings, mm -hmm. but you're still working. Yeah. So my question is with Malibu Creek right next door and with the large hands that you have in, um, you know, ensuring that it remains a great place for humans and flora and fauna alike to enjoy, have you ever taken time to like explore the creek or hike or camp over there? Um, well, especially right now, it is it is a beautiful uh, environment to work in. And after all this rain, it is extremely green right now. So it's probably the most beautiful I've ever seen. Mm -hmm. We're having super blooms all around. Yes. And it is a very special place to work being tucked away and hidden um, as we are. As you said, we're just in the center of the Santa Monica Mountains and not too many people know about us. So mm -hmm. it's a quiet and beautiful place to work. I have done quite a few hikes around there. So yeah, I mean, you take advantage and try to avoid traffic yeah. when, when you're commuting. Yes. So, so after work, it's, it's let me go for a short hike and coworkers will commune together. Oh, that's amazing. And do hikes, bike rides, um, walks around the... Um, Hiking trails, the uh, uh, Malibu Creek uh, State Park. Mm -hmm. There's lots of recreational opportunities in this area. Yeah. Another shameless <laughs> plug. You come and work for the Los Virginis Triunfo JPA, and you get all of this natural beauty yeah. surrounding you. So on your walk, you can just go take a nice little casual stroll next to the creek and, you know, go take a hike with your coworkers after work. Like, it doesn't really get much better than that. Nope, it doesn't. And yeah. I mean, during a break, you can just take a walk around the facility. And I know it's an industrial facility, but it's still surrounded by these beautiful mountains. So yeah. it's still a fun uh, little walk around the the job site <laughs> yeah and you mentioned that like we're kind of tucked away and not many people know about the facility that is a on purpose <laughs> and b that's a pretty solid feat because again that's wastewater there mm -hmm. raw wastewater being treated and there are um you know treatment processes air treatment processes implemented there that make sure that that environmental impact is 
as low as possible, right? So like the carbon filters are there to help minimize smell mm -hmm. and you guys keep some of the tanks at the primary tanks covered. I mean, you saying that like the, the knowledge of that facility being there is very low. A lot of work goes into that <laughs> and that's a great accomplishment for sure. Yeah, I often get visitors commenting, um, oh, I never knew this was here. This is so cool. What do you guys do here? And those are mostly the delivery folks or people yeah. that don't come often yeah. uh, and and they want to know more immediately because they they're there to drop something off or yeah. make a delivery mm -hmm. and they want to know where they're at yeah what is this place? what is this yeah and you know we love the curiosity mm -hmm. uh we are big on tours at uh the jpa we mm -hmm. offer tours of tapia actually fun fact veronica gave those tours for years at tapia before i started four years ago and to this day Veronica will come into her office and see like a frantic email from me asking something about like denitrification and nitrification and is it nitrate to nitrite or nitrate to nitrate or <laughs> nitrogen gas it's just like it's so much and I'm so lucky to have someone like Veronica that has been here as long as she has and is as knowledgeable as she is. And that's that knowledge transfer yeah. that we were talking about earlier, right? Mm -hmm. Like you were talking about like losing these people that have all of this institutional knowledge, but me only being here at LV for four years, you are someone that I look at as having that institutional knowledge. And anytime I have a question specific to the, you know, tertiary mm -hmm. process and the biological nitrogen reduction, I mean, that took me like some time to <laughs> understand. I remember Veronica came to headquarters and we went into a meeting room and she like wrote out the formula like on the board to lecture me about what the heck is going on and that type of knowledge transfer and sharing and openness is invaluable and having someone like you here Veronica that not only has that institutional knowledge but the willingness to share it over and over and over again because <laughs> that's what I needed to be able to talk about it comfortably that's invaluable and that's a strength that we have here at the JPA that's how our staff is that's what the culture here is and we are also able to share that with the general public and that's what makes us sort of such a leader in all things water and watershed protection specifically in our region not only do we have the knowledge but we have the transparency and we want to share it we want to make sure that our stakeholders and our customers and everyone living here has access to this information and that they're in the know um, because this is their home just as much as it is ours right yeah of course it's nice that you brought that up um, i do enjoy t uh, providing tours of tapia these days, it's far more technical tours yes, yes. or inspections from regulators. Sure. Uh, but when I get class classes or back when I was um, doing the tours more uh, for an educational like school group mm -hmm. tours, it, it brought me back to my early days of, of being an educator yes. in the marine biology uh, field yeah and the wonder that comes <laughs> from like discovery right yeah getting that little water sample or the bacterial sample and then putting it underneath the scope and then putting it on the tv for the kids to see all the little bacteria doing their thing yeah a micro a micro uh slide from yeah one of our bnr basins that's always uh, fun. that's always fun to find to to take a look to see what critters are swimming around in yeah. there so doing our dirty work mm -hmm. so i do works. i do enjoy changing my tours to focus on the appropriate age group yeah for sure mm -hmm. and it's also a solid reflection of just how much you know because it's one thing to know all of the regulatory things and be able to speak regulatory speak or technical speak but you know that someone is really knowledgeable when they're able to adjust the information that they're sharing based on the group that they're with and break it down and water it down as much as necessary like that's how you know that someone really knows their stuff and that's definitely veronica thank you ricky yeah so thank you for joining us thank you for sharing more of your knowledge i'm very lucky to have you on um you have had so much experience in the industry but you still like we said earlier have so much ahead of you i think that you're really a solid example of the potential of the human side of things in water, right? Um, 
what your interest was starting and what mm -hmm. you studied in school and kind of where you're at right now and you're still so young I mean you have years ahead of you like in this industry and that's really exciting to see especially for someone like me yeah oh, thank you yeah I look forward to seeing how my career grows continues yeah. to grow there's still so much knowledge that I need to and now with um, the acceptance or, and moving forward with uh, advanced water treatment facilities, mm -hmm. there's going to be several new regulatory changes and yeah. permits involved and treatment processes that I will have to learn for myself. Yeah, you and a lot of other people. I mean, th this is the type of project, this is the type of technology that spurs a lot of really great mm -hmm. work opportunities and career opportunities. Um, and we're gonna talk about that um, in a future episode, but for now, anyone that's interested in learning about what happens at Tapia, we have tours at Tapia year round. Obviously we have pure water tours here at the demo. If you are interested, we implore you implore you to come and learn about it you can chat with myself veronica is also always gracious and makes herself available to share her expertise again this project and sort of the regulatory side of things and the watershed protection a lot of components it's a lot to learn but very much worthwhile and so we will continue to dig into that um, with the full circle podcast and until then veronica thank you again we will see you guys next time Bye. Thank you, Ricky. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Full Circle Podcast. Make sure to follow us on Twitter at LVMWD, on Instagram at Los Virginis underscore MWD, and on Facebook at LVMWD. Find our Full Circle Podcast on your favorite streaming service or go to ourpureh2o.com and smash on the Full Circle Podcast link for all other episodes.